Welcome to What is Root Cause Analysis and Why is it Valuable? In this presentation, we will review the value of root cause analysis. We will discuss several of the key concepts that support root cause analysis and end by highlighting some of the tools that you may find to be especially useful. Root cause analysis, or RCA, is a structured process used to determine why an event, an unexpected or unintended outcome occurred and what can be done to prevent it from happening again. The topic of an RCA is often referred to as an event, suggesting that it is something, seri to, something considered to be important. While the RCA process can be used on an event of any scale, it is typically a larger or more significant event that triggers a team-based RCA investigation. RCA can be considered as a tool for quality improvement as it is a method for learning from our past experiences in order to change our systems and processes going forward. RCA is a team-based investigative approach that focuses on systems and processes and their impact on individual behavior rather than on the individual behavior. RCA is not something that is done well with just one person working alone and should not be something that is done by leadership without the involvement of the staff that care about or are impacted by the process being analyzed. The value of RCA is that it helps us break the habit or tendency to go for the quick fix. Sometimes we are so sure we know the problem and how to fix it only to find out later that we did not really address why something happened and therefore the event is repeated. The focus on understanding why something happens helps staff learn how to analyze problems rather than looking for the quick fix as well. The process of RCA also fosters a non-punitive culture as it helps us shift the focus away from individual behavior. For example, RCA would not lead us to say this would ha not have happened if he or she had done their job correctly. The RCA process also guides teams to measure the actual success of the process change. Did it happen as expected? And the outcome or the impact on resident or patient care. In all these ways, RCA is a tool to improve safety. This slide contrasts approaches to addressing problems. Successful RCA uses the approaches that are listed as being more effective. For example, instead of a focus on individual blame, a more effective approach is to focus on conditions or systems that influence individual performance. Instead of punishing errors, it's more effective to learn from errors and change systems. Instead of expecting perfect performance, it is more effective to expect professional performance and realize there are human limitations. And instead of using discipline or education as the main actions to prevent recurrence, it is more effective to base actions on root cause findings, generally a change in the process. The high level steps in the RCA process are listed here. Identify the event, select the team, describe the event, identify all factors, identify root causes and contributing factors, create a change, and measure to determine results. Within each of these steps, the team will use their basic QI tools such as creating a timeline, flow charting the current process to identify, identify where breakdowns occurred, creating a cause and effect diagram or fishbone to group potential root causes and contributing factors into categories, brainstorming corrective actions, using PDSA to test and implement changes, developing process and outcome measures to, term, to determine impact, and identifying ongoing measurement to determine if the change is sustained over time rather than reverting to the old way of doing things. Because RCA requires us to think differently, it is helpful to review several key concepts. The terms process and system get thrown out frequently in quality improvement and in RCA. Here is a way to define and differentiate the terms. Process can be thought of the step as the steps to be followed and is often guided by policies and procedures. System instead is a combination of processes, people, culture, environment, equipment, and all those other things. An example would be medication administration. This can be thought of as a system composed of many processes and impacted by the people involved, the environment, and the equipment. If we make change to one part of that system, 
it could have an impact on all other aspects as well. Once we start identifying our processes and symptom, systems, we are starting to perform systems thinking. In order to do this, we need to believe that the parts of a system can be best understood through how they relate to each other, rather than in isolation. It requires critical thinking skills to analyze, synthesize, and evaluate information. This does not come naturally and does require practice. In addition to the concept of systems thinking, there are several theories that help us in performing effective RCA. Three of these theories are human factors, tunnel vision, and the Swiss cheese model. Human factors are those elements that influence the performance of people operating equipment or systems. A simplistic way to think of human factors is that human factors are the things that differentiate us as humans. Human factors include our physical and cognitive abilities, as well as our limitations. For example, as humans, our performance is influenced by distraction, reliance on memory, and emotion. Whenever we are looking at an unintended outcome or event, we have to take into account what we know about our human factors and how effectively the systems and process we, processes we have in place support us to do what we intend. In human factors, the term error is used to identify a mistake or a deviation from what was intended or expected. In contrast to how we often think of error as something we did wrong, human factors sorts errors into unintentional or intentional. The vast majority of errors we encounter are unintentional and the result of outside influences on our performance. Intentional error is very uncommon. This is one of the reasons that discipline is not an effective way to prevent most errors. A very important concept in human factors is that human error is actually predictable and the expected rate of error can be measured. This table shows the probability of error in a few situations. For example, reading labels is something we are generally good at and the probability of error is low, but not zero. Three out of a thousand times we, re we read a label, we will make a mistake. While this sounds very low, it can actually re represent a fair number of errors since this is a very common task. The third activity is especially interesting as often we look to a second, che second check as a way to prevent errors. However, this is not effective as we know that one out of ten errors will not be detected by a second check. This is why double checks are not considered to be a strong corrective action and likely a waste of staff time and energy with little benefit. The final example is the probability of error in situations where we are working quickly in a high stress situation. In this case, the probability of error is 25%. Therefore, even though these situations may not occur frequently, it is important that our systems and processes support us in preventing error. Human factors engineering is the practice of taking into account our unique human traits when designing the tools, devices, or equipment with which we use. We want our tools to enhance our performance and help us prevent errors rather than confuse or mislead us into unintentional error. Many of us remember the old VCR players that had lots of buttons, but none of them were easy to figure out and constantly, consequently many people paid for, but never used most of the functions on the VCR. Contrast that with the newer smartphones that almost seem to anticipate what we need next. Successful designs do not force us to make an extra effort to interact successfully with an interface or a device. Human factors is relevant to RCA because it teaches us to avoid reliance on memory and vigilance and instead make use of protocols and checklists, to simplify processes by taking out extra steps where we could potentially make an error, standardize procedures to reduce unintended variation, and use constraints and forcing functions that force us to do certain steps. For example, the car won't lock until the lights are turned off. Tunnel vision is the next theory that relates to human factors. In tunnel vision, there are two ways to look at the path leading to an unintended outcome from inside and outside the tunnel. When we are going through our day, we are inside the tunnel, choosing our path 
based on the information we have at each juncture along the way. From outside the tunnel, it is easy to look at the outcome and then say, why did this happen? It should have been so obvious. However, this is not generally true. When you are in the tunnel, you do not have the benefit of seeing the end result of the path you have chosen. You can only make the best decision possible at each step along the way. When we are outside the tunnel, we cannot judge based on the outcome. We need to decide why decisions were made along the way and how to make different choices in the future. Instead of looking at an unintended outcome or event from outside the tunnel, we need to try to get inside the tunnel. By doing this, we avoid hindsight bias and the old saying that hindsight is 2020, and we understand why actions made sense at the time. Doing this helps us understand the quality of decisions are not determined by the outcome, but instead the use of the information available at the time. Getting inside the tunnel helps us realize that information for decision making does not come all at once. Each new piece of information and the order in which it arrives can alter the path we take. And it helps us see how all potential outcomes cannot be realized along the way. The concept of tunnel vision is important to RCA because the point of the RCA process is to understand why people did what they did, not to judge them for what they did not do. And getting inside the tunnel allows us to fully understand why individual actions were felt to be reasonable at the time. The final theory is the Swiss cheese model, where the barriers we have designed to prevent errors are thought of as multiple slices of Swiss cheese. They are Swiss cheese because no barrier is perfect. They all have holes, and these holes can be thought of as continually varying in size and position. Unintended outcomes and errors occur when the holes in each of the slices align. Here's a graphic of how we can look at our typical environment. The slices on the left are what we would like to have because there are no holes and would keep the potential hazards that are lurking in our environment from causing harm. Unfortunately, what we do have is on the right. We have barriers with holes of various shapes and sizes. And when these holes align, we have an unintended outcome or error. So what causes these holes? We refer to the holes as latent conditions because they represent weaknesses in our processes or systems that can be present for long periods before they are recognized. They hang around unintended until there is an active failure or unintended outcome or error. We tend to focus on the active failures because they are easily recognized and often have an immediate impact. We talked about active failures being on the sharp end of the system because like a knife, it is the sharp end that does the actual cutting, but it is the handle of the knife that directs the blade. The handle is like the latent failures. We need to understand what was behind the act of failure in order to identify these holes in our barriers, because only by identifying the holes can we work to eliminate them or make them as small as possible. The Swiss cheese model is important to RCA because it reminds us to look beyond the active failures or the unintended outcomes and errors to find the latent conditions. It is the latent conditions that will most likely be the root cause. It will rarely be the active failure. The root cause will typically be a process or a system that can be redesigned in order to reduce the risk of error. All these theories support the goal of RCA, which is to determine why something happened and to prevent it from happening again. Before we end, I want to touch on what types of events can trigger an RCA. What is listed here are the most common. Unexpected events with serious outcomes, repeating incidents, near misses, and good catches. We may also find ourselves using the RCA process on, small, on a small scale to determine why something happened. Any opportunity to practice RCA in the RCA process helps us build our systems thinking skills. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of common quality improvement tools used in RCA. These include teamwork supports such as brainstorming, affinity grouping, consensus building, flow charting or process mapping, cause and effect diagrams or fishbones. This is a technique 
used to identify and classify root causes and contributing factors. The advantage of the fishbone is that it works well for comp complex problems. The drawback, however, is that it takes practice to do well and can get messy very quickly. The Plan, Do, Study Act, or PDSA, is a useful tool in RCA to test and implement process changes, and tools such as run charts and control charts can be useful to monitor success. Although common QI tools are useful in RCA, the most important tools are listed here. These are your critical thinking skills, having a non-judgmental attitude, the desire to understand why, and a belief that we can always do better. Thank you for listening.